Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Well, hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Kao, one of the world's leaders on CTO intervention. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Manos. It's my pleasure. Yeah. And thanks so much. I know you've been one of the forces behind the Asia-Pacific CTO algorithm. You've done a lot of demonstrations, teachings, publications, developing techniques. What made you go into this uh, complex uh, CTO PCI area? I think that's a uh... That's a very interesting question, you know, because uh, I started working in the PCI field since 1995, 96, right? Uh, only until about the early uh, 2000s, maybe 2001, I, I really started uh, getting serious about CTO intervention because before that, we don't have the uh, proper equipment. And most importantly, we don't have something that we can secure the result for a longer term. I mean, you, you you may spend three hours in the CAT lab putting a bare metal stand, and then in six months, it's gone. So it, it's like throwing stone in the water, useless. But uh, at that time, because of the DS is on the merge, uh, I mean, on the horizon, uh, we realized that maybe we can have something that uh, be competitive to surgical bypass that is both durable and uh, providing benefit for the patient. And of course, in the Asian population, the patient will be more willing to accept this kind of minimal invasive procedure. Perfect. So the population wants less surgery and you're able to offer this to him. But who were the people who motivated you and taught you, helped you learn how to do these complex procedures? Oh, uh, well, okay. Um, I can tell you this, uh, in my institution, I am probably the first one embarking on the CTO intervention. So in the beginning, I was kind of an odd person, you know. So uh, I basically learned from uh, outside. Uh, I watched people doing CTO cases. And of course, at that time, it was also very premature. So a lot of things are developing. But uh, I admire always looking at uh, uh, Mitsuto Sensei at work. You know, uh, Dr. Mitsudo from Japan. Sure. Uh, so uh, he, I would say he would be one of my mentor in the CTO arena, although I did not formally uh, get uh, education or uh, learn from him. I just watch him doing cases. And of course, he visited our center several times working on cases and then, you know, learning and also uh, admiring his spirit or his uh, persistence on the case. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So how did it feel? You're starting essentially a new area of PCI, right? You're the first one in your center and probably in Taiwan and many other places as well. So how how did, how did was it? Uh, was it tough? Uh, people were welcoming it? Were skeptical? Of course. You have uh, said everything that the people said about me. Uh, in the beginning, you know, people said that, well, the patient is surviving with the CTO, so it's not necessary to reopen the vessel. I believe you get that a lot, right? The patient is survival, okay. it's living. So these, why, why should we open this vessel? That's the first thing. Secondly, people will be uh, uh, standing in the control room saying that you are wasting too much time and resource and we have more cases in the cat lab while you are taking up the time and, and the resource on, on, a, on a futile procedure. And of course, uh, we will have failure, uh, have complications, Patients will not be happy. So we get all these kind of negative uh, uh, influence. But uh, I think uh, CTO, opening up a CTO, especially in a proximal large vessel, perf perfusing a, a viable myocardium, I believe in this procedure. So I think uh, you have to have faith in what you're doing. Absolutely. So yeah. you were able to slowly, I guess, win over the people with the outcomes and the results. And you obviously you published extensively on the area and on the retrograde, for example, epicardials. But uh, uh, what kept you going to those early days where people would say were mm. critical? Was it the belief mm. that you, you are into something? What actually mm. made you persist and get through the difficulties? Well, first of all, you have to believe in yourself, right? So 
you know, after those failure cases, especially after a long case, I would always ask myself, why should I be doing this? You know, uh, I, I and I would check the steps or, or what I'm having in my mind. What did I do? What What is wrong in the case? You know, I have all these kind of mental uh, exercise or review on the case. So the more you review on your case, the more you realize that it, it's about getting better skill and technique and device, but the concept itself is viable. Absolutely. So, so you, you have to motivate yourself, so to speak. Hmm. Perfect. So you've done many, many cases and you're very um, expert in doing these cases. Are you, how are you preparing? Are you still preparing detail for this case? The things easier now? How do you prepare for this case? Well, I always ask for a very good diagnostic uh, film, uh, cine, cine angiograms, because uh, I think, uh, you know, sometimes I spend 30, 40 minutes reading and watching the, the cine frame by frame, back and forth. Sometimes I ask for a CT so that I can understand more on the case. But you, you, you need to spend a lot of time before, the, before you actually embark on the case. I always uh, say this to my fellows that... Uh, strategy strategy is more important than actual tactics so instead of talking about devices techniques but you have to think about the whole strategy you have to look at the whole picture what is what would be your first step and what will happen when you do the first step there could be multiple results and then after these is happening. I mean, the case is like a flower, it's evolving. So you open up the first layer of your petal, then you will see the next one. But then don't make yourself surprised. You have you always have to think, you know, ahead of times. I always say that, well, you are doing this procedure. Can you expect that the three, three minutes or five minutes from now, what will happen? And then at that time, what would you do? So everything should be planned ahead. Perfect. So even now you still spend a lot of time planning and preparing for yes. this case. Yes. Perfect. And then do you get nervous? You have the experience, but do you get nervous some of the cases now? Do you get stressed out, anxious, or now that's routine, it's everyday practice? Well, I would say the stress threshold is getting higher and higher, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Going the so other I'm, way. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm more and more relaxed on the cases. I mean, you spend time thinking about the case beforehand, before you actually start. You get ready. The devices, the the people, the environment, you get you get everything ready. And then you start on the case and you 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 are expecting something to happen. So when 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 you can actually foresee what will happen in five minutes or 10 minutes, you, you get less stressed. Sometimes you can even say to your fellow, well, this is what is going to happen, you know, two, three minutes or four minutes from now. And then things just happen as you expect it. Then <laughs> that will be. The most beautiful experience <laughs> looking yeah. into the future this is probably yeah 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 um how do you how do you communicate with your referring physicians i know it's a big community um do you always call them back after the case how do you manage this interaction which is very important obviously for the referrals and for the patients yeah well, i think uh situation may be different from country to country i know in the states you got your referrals and then you do the procedure send the patients back to the referring referring physician but uh, here in Taiwan, it's a bit different. Uh, usually, uh, you will get referral because already the case was failed by one of your friends. And once he is referring the case to you, basically, he's handing the patient to you. So uh, uh, instead of uh, having this concept of a referral physician, but rather I will ask the, the doctor who is giving the patient to me and come to my lab to work with me while I'm working. So you see, most of the time, the patient will stay with, with me instead of going back to the referral. But uh, I mean, uh, but we have very good relationships with, with, with doctors who is sending patients over to me because I give them a, a chance to look at what we are doing and, and what are different uh, between our lab and uh, theirs. Yeah, and I think maybe you know, the, the specifics are different, but the, common and the denominator is that you still have a very good relationship and it's a very you know collegial cordial relationship and of the course. patient benefits yes. benefits at the end from all this yes so are there any cases that stand out in your memory 
from the thousands you've done? Any cases that really influenced who you are and that you left an impression on you for a long time? Yeah, I, I would say a positive case. Okay, I still remember this young gentleman in his uh, 40s, early 40s. He's a businessman doing doing business uh, in China. So he was uh, announced to have end stage heart failure because he has a huge heart and, and a very poor ejection fraction. And the uh, ECG looks, you know, there's no infarction, no infarction. So uh, because of the clinical background and the situation, he was uh, sent to one of our surgeons on a pre-transplantation uh, workup. But then, of course, the cat showed that a triple vessel CTO. And, and at that moment, of course, the patient was sent instead of a transplant program, but for a viability workup, which showed that all the muscles are actually hibernating. So we opened the vessel one by one. And then after all the, the three CTO procedures, his heart literally shrank and the ejection fraction became normal. So he's fully functional now. And, and I, I would say that would be the most rewarding uh, experience for an interventionalist. Absolutely. You're right. He's a patient yeah. with no options, essentially, who's sent for transplant. And then all of a sudden, he's functioning without any yeah. sternotomy. No. I mean, that's, that's amazing. No. No. Um, now, of course, that's, that's a positive one. I can also give you a <laughs> negative one if you want. Sure. Sure. Okay. Sounds perfect. Again, same a gentleman in his 40s. Uh, had a nasty LED CTO, tried multiple times outside. Stem to me. I work with the, 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 the physician who sent the case to me. And then we got carried away. So we spent too much time and radiation on the patient. And then during the procedure, we forget about checking the ACT. So the patient actually, well, the vessel was recanalized, but then he had a donor thrombosis. So we need to put in ECMO to save him. And then he was uh, having an emergent bypass surgery. But then following the procedure, he had a nasty back ulcer because of the radiation. So he had another several plastic surgery to his back. Luckily, the patient survived. But, uh, you know, it's, it's always a reminder that we can do harm to patients. No, absolutely. And you're right, I think mm -hmm. with the new machines, the X-ray dose is coming down. I think probably most places worldwide has come down. But you're right. I mean, these are long procedures, can be very complex. And I think all of us have had our share of complications like this, so can completely relate. And I think actually sharing these complications helps other people as well to be cognizant, you know, that this is not a benign procedure always, that you have to always pay attention to this thing. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing those cases. This is wonderful. Now, about your students, you've taught many people, again, both in Taiwan, in Asia, around the world. Um, do you, how do you select your students? Do you say that this person is going to be a great operator? Do you, can you tell who it's going to be? What makes you excited about teaching someone to do CTO or complex PCI? Okay. That, that's a very interesting question. Actually, I haven't thought about it before, but first of all, I think this guy must be very driven. He must be enthusiastic about the case. You know, when you have a fellow, you know, one hour into the procedure, he starts to uh, wandering around and, uh, start to uh, look at elsewhere. You know, this guy is not a CTO person, right? Who is always focused on the case, following the progress, knowing your next step. When, when, whenever I had a fail fellow that I don't have to tell him what I need, he always hand me the, the thing that I'm expecting. Then I realize he's the, going to be the one because he's following my mental process. He understands that what is happening, what will be happening. I think that that, that will be my selected student. So, so focus and persistence and keeping up with what is going on. And admittedly, yeah. you know, these very long cases can be challenging to follow through. As you said, the passion yeah. is important. Yeah. Um, and how long does it take someone to learn? I know you've, you know, we've taught many people. Do you take 50 cases? Always debate this, right? Is it take mm -hmm. a specific number of cases? Is it the number of months? Is it the person's attitude? H how can you tell how, how long someone is going to take to learn? Mm, you mean... You mean being a proficient uh, CTO operator? That's right. So, well, of course, you have to be a complex PCI operator before you can be a CTO operator. I think CTO is the pinnacle of uh, PCI. So you have to know what to deal with the calcification, tortuosity, diffuse lesion, bifurcation, everything. Because in CTO, you will face all these problems. So I would say at least 100 complex PCI cases 
before you can really become a CTO operator, I would say. So, so I think CTO is not for someone who is uh, in his first or second year of uh, uh, interventional fellow. I mean, he can be an assistant, but not the operator. Sure. Mm. And then, and then uh, when it comes to teaching, you've done many live cases, showing the things, uh, the cases you do around the world. Uh, what do you think is the best way to learn? Is obviously doing them. Live cases are helpful. What are the things that you recommend to people who want to learn this? Well, first of all, I think observation is very important. You know, it's it's not that important. I mean, you don't have to be on the table with the operator standing by his side. Of course, that is a very good learning experience. But then looking at the case, especially when a case is transmitted from the beginning to the end, you know, some of these modern live transmission sessions are becoming a variety show. You have four rooms happening at the same time, and then you got switches back and forth. When the case looks stalled, it was switched to another room immediately. But actually, when the case was looking, you know, progress very slowly, actually, sometimes that's the very interesting part. It's not about, do, do you know what I mean? Sometimes when the CTO is not, when the case is not moving, it doesn't mean that it's, it's not interesting. So I think uh, a good CTO transmission should be a case that at least start from the, uh, uh, I wouldn't say from starting from the puncture, but at least from the analysis of that the diagnostic film, the, the operator's interpretation on the diagnosis, the operator's interpretation or explanation on his planned strategy. I think this is very important. And that's why uh, I myself and you are very emphasizing on the algorithm. Because with algorithm, the operator can actually give you a mental map of what is he's planning on the case. You got a map to follow through so that you know the operator knows what to do next. It's not just by chance or, or a very, I mean, in, improv or, or uh, I mean, decision on the spot. It shouldn't be like that. No, absolutely. And I think what you said is also the important thing, like this Zen attitude that you know, th- the bad things, the tough things are actually the ones that sometimes make or break the case, right? So when it's stalled, that's actually the moment you want to be there because you want yes. to see what's going to, how yes. they're going to tackle this issue and how it's going yes. to make it work. But yeah. I agree with you that sometimes time pressures becomes hard for, for live case. And people, I think, have this attitude of being entertained as well, that you want to see different things and things don't work. Maybe it's not quite as interesting. So this mm. is this is uh, great. Mm. Now, um, apart from the CTO, what else keeps you going? What are you excited uh, about right now? Well, I think education. Education. You know, I am very enthusiastic about finding a good fellow, you know, identifying who is going to be the next uh, operator in my institution. Because we, you know, well, I myself is, uh, is in my uh, late 50s. So uh, I would say that I cannot continue to push on this like this forever, right? So it, it's always nice that you can you can find someone younger than you, uh, communicate with you uh, without any difficulty, understand what you are thinking, and then looking at this guy to perform a case sometimes is really rewarding. So I, I'm I'm very interested in education and uh, talking to my fellows and young staff right now. Perfect, perfect, and and obviously building not only your institution but I think across the country and uh, and yeah. beyond. Yeah. yeah. Now, how about uh, you know for you as you said, I mean you're still pretty young, but uh, <laughs> you do a lot of complex cases, take many yeah. hours. How do you keep in shape? What do you do to keep you physically and mentally fit to do these um, complex cases? Well, of course, physically you have to uh, exercise, you have to work, work out, you have to watch your diet, and also resting is is very important. So uh, I think uh, to have enough sleep is important, but sometimes it's a luxury. You know, we as an interventionalist, especially you know, in some institution, you have to work uh, for in primary emerging cases. You know, it, it's tough. It's tough. Sure. But I think resting is very important. And 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 also the other thing is that sometimes clear your mind is also important. So for me, I would tell you, uh, whenever it's possible, I never, I never read any medical journal or textbook. Once I got home, you know, okay. I, I I separate I separate these two arena. So when I leave the hospital, it means that for me it's done. So I go home, maybe late, but I won't I wouldn't uh, carry any work back home or do any study at home. 
Wonderful. Uh, so what, what do you do at home? What's your favorite book? Is it when oh, you read that from medicine? Yeah, yeah. You, you have this in, in your list. You know, I will give you a surprise. My favorite book is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Perfect. What, why? Why, yeah. why is that? that what, what in it makes you um, be fascinated? Well, you see, I don't know in, in the States, but in Taiwan, I think politically it's getting there. So, uh, you know, there are so many people demanding on, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't say this too much, but I think sometimes people are, are being very dependent on others and uh, at, uh, saying this is their right to have a share on whatever that is achieved. But uh, yeah. So being able to achieve so, yourself, I mean, that, and actually that's part of the yeah. city operator, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're starting something, there's a lot of risk, a lot of uncertainty, but you're, mm -hmm. if you keep with it, you can, you can move forward to the next level. Um, how about a movie? What's your favorite movie? Uh, Godfather, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why is that? What is, uh, is the well, fatherly uh, figure that directs everything? No, I, I, I like that kind of uh, bond. I mean, I mean, family, friends, you know, just like I said, you know, when you are working in the cat lab with one of your best fellow, you know, it's almost like uh, having a, a dinner with your family or your friend, right? Absolutely. So, uh, Absolutely. yeah, I like that uh, feeling that you are surrounded by people who knows you and, uh, and you are sharing a same uh, value and you are trying to achieve something uh, on the same goal. Yeah. And Absolutely. we watch each other's back. <laughs> yeah, and that's important. I mean, you know, feeling yeah. good and feeling, you know, in companion with people, I think actually say makes uh, the case go better and makes you feel better as well. Yeah. So what are you most proud of? Well, I, I don't have anything to be proud of. I still think that I'm. Oh, yes, I'm, you do. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, no, no. I'm not being. Uh, I mean, there, uh, there are still a lot of things that uh, I, I haven't done yet. Uh, a lot of things that I think in in my in my whole life I couldn't have done it. So I, I, I still admire people who can do things that uh, you know it's really beyond my capability. For example, recently I'm I'm watching on the Netflix about the, the mountaineers on the K2 summit or Mount Everest. You know, so I, I don't have anything to be proud of. I would say I, I would be I can say that there are something that I'm happy that I can do. For example, a case that is very tough considered very complex by all of the other operators, but I achieved, a, 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 I, I executed the case exactly as a, my mental map tells me within maybe two hours or one and a half, then I'll be very happy. Perfect. Well, I guess happy yeah. and proud can be synonyms in that in this context. <laughs> but I mean, clearly, you know, being able to achieve this, this is impressive. Plus also, I think the patients benefit and, and you feel good about what you've achieved. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Now, any advice, any plans you have for retirement? Are you planning to do this? You said before that you're, you know, getting up there, but obviously very young still. Do you plan to do this until you are 80, 90? What do you think? <laughs> no, the, the actual PCI, I wouldn't say 80, 90. I think that would be too much. I think, I think probably 60, 65 would be my, my time to stop actually working on the case. But I will never stop teaching. I will never stop uh, talking and discussing with my, my with my young fellows uh, on their cases, on any general issues, on general medicine, general cardiology. You know, wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, any advice you have? So, for the people who are starting to learn this, or who are early in their you know pathway to learning this complex PCI CTO PCI, what would be your piece of advice? What should they do to become like yourself and become an established um, you know, high-end operator who can do very difficult cases? I think first, observation. Observation. You have to watch people doing their cases. And you have to be able to appreciate which case is done beautifully, with not just successfully, but beautifully. I mean, I think sometimes, um, you know, it's very difficult to explain in English, but in Chinese, you know, when something looks beautiful, something must be right. When, when you are designing, for example, you are designing a fighter jet, let's say an F-15. It's a fighter jet. 
So the des designer is looking at functionality of it. They will never spend any more time trying to make it look beautiful, right? They want the plane, the plane to be faster, more maneuverable, you know, more powerful. But then at the end, you will have a product that looks to the out to the layman beautiful. It's a beautiful airplane, but it's not designed to be beautiful. So when when you are looking at the case, when the case was done, you suddenly have this feeling that oh, the case was beautiful. Then you 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 start to appreciate uh, the difference of a successful case versus a beautiful case. And then observation, like I said, and then try to incorporate algorithm into your thinking process, your planning, because all these algorithms actually helps you to visualize the path of the case that is going on. Uh, and also uh, it gives you a format or a structure to judge or gauge your thinking process, whether you are thinking correctly or or or, or wrongly, uh, you have a framework to judge, uh, and also uh, it's a very good way to accumulate your own experience, because when you are turning to the left and all always wrong, then you realize okay you should turn to the right. So it's not a by chance uh, procedure. It's always uh, you are doing something for a certain reason. You are successful or fail failure for a certain reason. There, there should be always a reason to explain. What do you have that? people to actually write down the, these algorithms? Do you write them down? Do you show them? How, how do you have people learn these algorithms? Which well, I agree it, is very useful. Yeah, it, it, it's published, right? We have this global one. You know, early on, a couple of years ago, we have our APCTO ones the Euro CTO club ones. And then now we have a, a very globalized uh, algorithm. I think I think people, I mean, people could in the beginning have different colors or, or likes, but after thorough communication discussion, I think finally everything will fall into more or less the same uh, decision tree. So I urge people really to, to look at the global algorithm to try to understand it. it, it it's a really good piece of uh, work. And thank you, Manos. You, you, I think this is a very important piece of tool for young beginners to learn how to do CTOs. No, thank you. And you know, all the people who contributed, this is you know, a team effort. And I think everyone put their own little piece there that make it look uh, good and useful for, for many more people. But again, Paul, I think that was wonderful. Again, I'm very impressed always, you know, how well you put things together, both in the case, but also when you're presenting and teaching people. So I really appreciate you taking the time today and sharing your insights with us. And um, again, I'm very um, um, envious for your students are actually in very good hands. They're learning a lot. And hopefully the people who listen to this will learn a lot. So thank you again so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Manos. Thank you, Manos, for your effort and uh, for everything. Thank you, Manos, my great friend. Thank you. Thanks again. Stay health, stay healthy, and hopefully we can see each other very soon in person. Sounds yeah. perfect. Thanks again, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 